Well, good morning, everybody. We have some change uh, for starting our conference. This is not official start, it will be later. Uh, due to unexpected changes, it shifted the sessions, the tutorial on room Berlin 2 and sessions, regular session in Berlin, Berlin 1. So we, we will start first with tutorial number two. An unexpected problem uh, does not allow Mr. Niedek to come here to present, but Mrs. Susan Vendi uh, is pleased to, to help us and present uh, his tutorial. She is with the same company, NORLB, and she is a, a consultant in the same area, expertise area, than Mr. Giedek. So we can thank she, we can thank her to, to be here. Um, the time is yours. Thank you very much. Yeah, good morning, everybody, and thank you for the nice uh, introduction. And indeed, um, Mr. Gniedek said this morning that he couldn't be here for the patent tutorial. Um, and so, uh, being his colleague, I said, okay, I can jump in. But I have to tell you that I am not a patent lawyer, so I cannot speak about patent law to you. Um, but I am working and advising clients in regard to product recalls and to product safety, the legal requirements of product safety within the European market, um, as well as product liability issues. And I know it's something different than patent law, and I want to say it very honestly before I start speaking, because then everybody who says, well, but I, would, I was here for the patent stuff uh, very specifically can um, still leave, even though I can promise you that it will be very interesting what we are talking about. Um, yeah, and the other thing is I heard that uh, Mr. Gniedek cannot be here this morning at 7.30, so I was not able to prepare any slides um, in English, so I don't have any slides with me, but I will check whether this laptop makes it into the internet, and then we can look at some recent product recall campaigns that are in the internet, and based on this, we can talk about how a product recall, which probably is for every company producing products, um, the worst case scenario ever, how we can turn this a very positive thing and how can we can find a positive wording and give it a positive impact to our re reputation being a manufacturing company. Um, yeah, as uh, there was one colleague who wanted to check outside whether there's some internet um, connection with this laptop, but as she didn't come back, I just try, if you agree, may I just try whether the Internet Explorer works? Or can I kaputt machen? doesn't work. Okay. Then we will go without any pictures. Um, and in Germany, they are in the mean in Germany there are a lot of people that say anyways, people who know what to say don't need any slides. So we will have a trial today whether this is true. First of all, um, I would love if we could do it an interactive thing together. So first question is who of you is coming from the US? Oh <laughs> and welcome to Berlin and that you took the um, long way. I thought it would be a lot more people coming from the US actually because it's an IEEE uh, conference. Um, okay, and who, who, uh, um, who is working for a company producing consumer electronics? This is a half, <laughs> half a person. <laughs> okay, um, so everybody else then is having background of distributing consumer electronics, or does anybody want to say anything about his background so we can take this into account within the tutorial? What the perspective is? Research, and the, it's the research department of a manufacturing company or of a research company or Testing Institute of University. Okay. Oh, that's great. <laughs> and it's but it's research in engineering, electronics. 
International standards, okay. Okay, that's what I'm doing from the legal perspective and I know that it, there's also technical side to this whole um, standardization process. Um, so I deal a lot with the technical people in this regard as well. Okay, anybody else wants to give us some information on the professional background? Oh, okay. okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's, but that's great. I think then we are a great group for discussing um, all these issues um, around product recalls in Europe. Okay, I speak from here now. Oh, yeah. Or maybe you, don't, you even hear me without the microphone, or is that too low voice? For the recording, for the recording. Okay, okay. Okay, then, um, can you hear me like this? Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so eventually we will have some pictures of product recalls later on, um, and I'm very thankful for you, uh, or thank you very much for trying this. <laughs> and um, until we have some pictures, we just start. And I would like to start with you from the US perspective. Um, coming from the US, you probably know very well the CPSC, which is the Consumer Product Safety Commission. And this is the market surveillance authority in the US for all kinds of consumer products, also for consumer electronics. And what does the CPSC do? The CPSC um, monitors products onto the market, and if they find a product they think might be or might have a safety issue, they would contact the manufacturer and eventually um, order some corrective action. What is corrective action? Corrective action can be different measures in order to prevent any danger or hazard to human health com coming from a product, product or being caused by a product. So such a measure could be um, um, such a measure could be either only a design change for the future, could be a warning that is given to consumer after the product has been placed onto the market, could also be um, a change of parts of a product or a change of a product such, or could be the classical product recall which means or which generally is understood as meaning that the manufacturer takes back the product with the potential safety issue and gives a new product to the consumer. And from the legal perspective in Europe, it's very high or very um, yeah, highly discussed whether the manufacturer is obliged to take a product with a safety issue back and give the consumer a new product. And I will come to the reasons why there's such big discussion around this point later. But we are starting in the US with the CPSC, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, um, and the CPSC is kind of embedded into a larger legal framework and well, I'm not a US attorney so I cannot really give you the very detailed um, and dogmatic description of this legal framework but I'm in contact with this framework very regularly because we are working with international product recalls not only covering Europe but also covering US, Australia, other regions of the world so I had contact with the CPSC and know a little and I would like to share this little with you as well. So there is a legal framework surrounding the CPSC and this legal framework knows a lot of obligations for manufacturing companies. Keeping in mind, we are always talking only about consumer products. Other products are regulated by other um, legal frameworks in the US and there are other authorities taking care of these products. But in regard to consumer products, always the CPSC, the important authority. And the legal framework surrounding the CPSC obliges the manufacturer, for example, to notify specific facts to the CPSC. And these facts that have to be notified to the CPSC are, for example, if the manufacturer has reason to think that one of the products he placed onto the market might cause a safety risk, a risk of injury to people. And this is one of the 
one of the cases in which a manufacturer has to notify to the CPSC. And in US law, there are very strict time limits for such notifications. So an experience I have sometimes, because I'm working with many producing companies, having either their main department in, um, in Europe and having subsidiaries in the US, or vice versa, having the main company in the US and having subsidiaries in Europe. And if in one of these countries, technical facts become known, people react very differently. People in the US want to be very quickly and people in Europe tend to say, we have some time to do some investigation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there, um, the CPSC has these, or the legal framework surrounding the CPSC, it's called the CPSA, it's the Consumer Safety Protection Act, which is a legal act, uh, contains these notification obligations covering if a company know, gets to know facts that um, might lead to the conclusion that um, there is a safety issue with one of the products in the field, there are other reasons or other facts that have to be notified to the CPSC, such as specific information about product liability litigation. The CPSC wants to know about that. Um, or information the manufacturer has about um, accidents that happened with its product. So this is coming from the US perspective, and now we go over the ocean to the European perspective. In Europe, we also have market surveillance authorities, and we do have a common European legal framework for product compliance law, product safety law, and also covering the aspects of product recalls. We do have different European directives, and I don't mention the numbers of them now because it's very hard to remember those without seeing anything, but we do have different product directives on the European level. For example, there's a specific one for consumer products, which is rather a general framework saying the manufacturer may only place safe products onto the market. And then we do have product specific directives. And the most relevant for consumer electronics are the low voltage directive and the, the directive on electromagnetic compatibility, which is hardly speakable and that's why we call it EMCD. <laughs> um, so there's regulation on electromagnetic compatibility, on low voltage safety requirements. Um, there's also a lot of regulation rather having an env env environmental um, impact such as packages of consumer products, um, dip, um, the, the waste management around batteries, it's all regulated. And some of these rules are not quite safety related but rather um, product compliance related. And then this European framework of product compliance law has one obligation which leads us to the product recalls. It is the obligation for the manufacturer to be prepared to take the necessary corrective action in case there is a safety issue caused by one of the products in the field. So, European law, European product compliance law, obliges the manufacturer to be prepared to take back products from the field that have a safety risk. This means very much this obligation because I don't know whether one of you already was part of such a potential product recall situation in which decision needed to be made um, about whether or not a product has to be recalled from the field but you need to be prepared for this as an, a company. It's not only that you know, okay, if we once know that there's a product risk, we need to take the decision, but in this situation, everything needs to go very quickly. The more quickly, the higher the risk is. And therefore, all, um, therefore all the procedures in the company have to be very good organized, it has to be practiced, um, and everything has to work. Something um, I experience very often is that um, indications for product risks come from consumer complaints and it's, you probably have been in contact with these procedures. If a consumer buys, let's say, a TV or a toaster or coffee machine or any other consumer electronics, um, electronic good, they go home and then the device doesn't work properly. properly. And people are very angry and they call the customer service and say, I bought this very expensive coffee machine, it doesn't work properly. And then what 
many call centers say is, okay, then send it back and we will send you a new one, or we repair it, or we give you back your money. These cases are pure quality cases. The consumer is, um, the consumer is not okay with the quality of the product. And in legal terms, this would be an issue in Europe under contract law. The consumer has a sales contract with the shop where he bought the device. In Germany, it would be, for example, Media Markt or Saturn. Um, and in this contract, the parties agreed about a specific product with specific characteristics. And the legal people say one of these characteristics in every case is that the product is fit for the usual purpose what it's used for. And then if the product's not fit for this purpose, because, for example, because the coffee machine, if I switch it on, does not work, it's nothing, no light, no coffee, no water, nothing, just not fit for its purpose, so I have a claim under the contract and I can either give back the product or get it repaired for free or even get my money back under specific circumstances. But this is only quality, it's not yet safety. And then we sometimes have cases, um, or I know from cases in um, customer, service departments of manufacturing companies where consumers call and say, I bought this very expensive coffee machine and then it didn't work and then it started to smoke. And I don't know whether you have an idea what a company should do with such a, with such a um, feedback from the field. What would you say if we were a manufacturing company, if you were the person responsible for the customer a support center, what would you tell people if someone calls and says the coffee machine didn't work and it smoked, what should they do? In terms of telling the customer to return it or follow up by looking at the design to see if there's a design flaw, for example. Both, yeah. Right. So, what, and what were they, what would, what would you people, your staff be supposed to do in such a situation? Wait. Obviously, go to do some testing to see if you replicate the fault. Yeah. And, and identify it and rectify it that it's a design change of your material change. It may be that um, there is a component that is bought from another supplier to put in that there is a faulty batch. And it's not a design problem, it's a secondary quality problem. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's very important. Whenever a company, manufacturing company, receives feedback from the field describing a situation with a product which could be safety relevant, there is an obligation to go deeper into this aspect and to carry out some further technical um, evaluation. And from a very practical view, do you have any idea how, how would people in the company and the specific staff members, how would they start this process of investigation? Yeah. Test on the ones that you yeah. complain about at the start. Yeah. Otherwise, you're trying to replicate the problem which may be an isolated one, yeah. where it may be a problem. So, you obviously want to get the faulty component or, or uh, item back from the customer. Yeah, that would be perfect. It, it is, it's always perfect to get the faulty piece back. Um, because in some cases, it might turn out that the customer said, Okay, thank you very much anyway for trying. <laughs> so we don't have any internet, so we go without pictures, but um, I think we will go through this um, still. Um, yeah, so the perfect thing would be to get the faulty piece back, because sometimes it turns out customers said, it smoked, or I almost died, or I couldn't breathe anymore. And then um, if the manufacturer has a chance to look at the device, you can find the weirdest thing. You can find things. You can find cat fur in the um, in the housing of the appliance, and then of course it overheated because the cat fur wasn't supposed to be there. And might be from the technical perspective, the cat fur might be different things. Might be um, some additional life part, so to say, and probably the technical terms are not uh, correct that I'm saying, but that's why we do have the technical people and the legal people, but the fur could be life parts, which is also, or the electricity is flowing through it, and then flowing other ways than it's supposed to be, and then we have an overheating, or um, you can find, sometimes it's possible to, to find out that the coffee machine had been switched on for three days or um, whatever, and then again, it's a technical finding and you need the legal people because then it's a legal question 
or technical legal question, whether the coffee machine should have been able to take these three days um, supply to the plug without any pause. So these are the questions that have to be dealt with uh, in order to find out whether we really need to recall a product or whether the product is completely fine and you can con continue to distribute it without any further changes. The European law gives some further guide guidance on how to find out whether there is um, a relevant product risk because the European Commission um, foresees a specific method of risk assessment and um, there were, there's a guiding document describing the risk assessment method um, and very briefly saying you need to find an injury scenario, so you need to find steps from the product fault to a potential injury and then you need to give these, um, these single steps probabilities, which is very difficult. Um, and for some of them you can find some data from general research or from technical findings. For example, if we stay with the example with the coffee machine, um, and if we go back from the overheating scenario to a rather um, a risk of, and I never say this word right, electrification, is that correct? No, probably. Yeah. <laughs> it's electrocution, right? Elec and, sorry? Big exam. Ah, okay. Okay. <laughs> um, so you know what I'm talking about. Um, and uh, there's always the question whether the household installation would have, in Germany we say FI sh switch. Stefan, maybe you know what this is in English. A main switch, yeah. Um, and you don't have this in all households. So, but if you have one, you will never have this injury of um, touching life parts because um, the um, the current is just cut down. Um, and so it's a technical question. How, prob how likely is it in every single country that you have such a main switch or you don't? So this is how we work together with the technical people in order to find out whether product recall is necessary or not. And this process of decision finding can be quite, can take some time because you always need technical investigation um, and further testing of your product you need to, well, when you have a new state of technical finding, you need to, um, to kind of mirror this in the legal assessment because then the legal people need to find out whether this changes something on the assessment they had before. And so it takes some time until the technical legal evaluation can be a basis for decision finding in regard to potential corrective measures. And this is also something very important. What do you think? Who's, who's deciding about whether product recall takes place or not within the manufacturing company? Is there any, would this be a decision of the people in the quality department or maybe the communication department? According to my experience, the people from communications, they always want to decide about it. And their decision is always very clear. As you probably can. From the legal perspective, this decision has to be made by um, the board of the company. It is a very pure decision of the people responsible for the company. And they can delegate this uh, decision um, to other people that are experienced and that are um, thoroughly chosen from a pool of people, but the responsibility is originally with the board of directors or whatever company um, you have with, with the, the lead of the company. So the decision finding process will, from the technical legal side, mostly come to um, a proposal for this board of, board of directors, for example, and they will decide. And then if we have the decision, yes, we do have a risk in the field and we need to take back these products. If you were um, the owner of a manufacturing company, what other staff members would you then take on, onto the, on, on, bo on board? No, you cannot say this in English. What other staff members would you include into the process after you know we will carry out a product recall? What people do you need?
Ya. Yeah, that's, um, that's also my experience that um, one of the first um, thoughts after the decision was made to carry out a product recall is how about our brand, how about our reputation? Um, and this is an issue where, um, well, it's only my, my personal feeling, I, I have the feeling that still a lot of people think our product recall is the worst thing ever um, and we try to avoid it. But we made the experience together with our clients that um, a good product recall can be a very positive thing, can be good for the reputation of a company. Um, because consumers then feel that the manufacturer is caring for them and providing solutions and you can also work with the wording of it and um, that's something I would have liked to show you but um, unfortunately we, we don't manage to get into the internet with one of these laptops right now. Um, is, for example, there was, um, there was one product recall in Germany a few years ago and it was, um, it was a toy that had to be recalled. It was like a little duck with um, wheels and children could pull it after them. It's something children between two and three love. And on the back it had some balls to put on a stick. So, and um, there was the um, a part of the duck could be ripped apart and this is something under European toys law which is absolutely not um, um, what would, which is absolutely not um, acceptable and then the recall, I only saw it in the internet but the recall was made very nicely and very clever it was a big picture of the duck and then it was like a red sign saying this duck wants to come back to us and when you clicked on the link it was a letter to the children and it said um, you probably are very close to your duck already and you probably gave it a name and it's really sick and please send it back and we will send it back to you with the injury fixed. And the company um, received really letters from customers afterwards from parents and said they have been so happy with the wording because with all the children were like, oh yeah, 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 we give it back. And um, so, it was, so the manufacturer helped the parents to get or to carry out the recall towards the children. And so um, there are possibilities to, to give this whole thing um, something good. If, it's, if the impression is not made that the manufacturer tried to avoid it and tried to, keep, to push, it, push it away as long as possible, but approaches it very actively and um, yeah, with, with cure it, with, with uh, courage and, um, and doesn't try to hide. In order to be able to carry out such a product recall which is taken as a positive thing, it's very important to, to prepare for a few things. And you may already mentioned one, we need to know for the financial aspects how many items do we have in the field worldwide? How, about how many items are we speaking? And um, this is something which might be difficult to find out if a company has different subsidiaries around the world because Maybe due to the different legal frameworks, um, according to my expectation, it's not people in another region in the world. If you call them as a staff member from a company and say, we have a really urgent thing here, we need to know how many of those you have in your market, it doesn't really reach them as being this urgent. 
as it should. So this is a widely made experience within companies that it's sometimes difficult that people around the world speak the same language and the same language other than English. They all speak English but still they don't understand each other and they don't understand the urgency. And this is something which has to be prepared way and long before we are in the situation of deciding about a product recall because then it's too late. You will not be able to set up such working communication flows within two weeks. This is something, some, something with had, which has to be built and prepared over years. So this is one aspect how a company can prepare um, for an actual product recall situation. So we need to know how many items do we have in the field and where are they? And then again, the legal people come on um, or have, have a task because they need to find out maybe in some of these regions we have very specific provisions um, regarding to market surveillance authorities, notification obligations, maybe there are specific requirements for carrying out a product recall. I know there are regions in the world where the market surveillance authorities say whenever you have a product recall, you need to have a TV spot, which is something which uh, in Germany we, I have hardly seen any TV spot with the product recall, but there are regions in the world where you need to have a TV spot and it's very difficult to convince the authorities that it's not necessary because you have only a few items in the field or um, because you can reach your customers directly. This is also a very important aspect, also for Europe, also for Germany, that as better you can reach your customers and the consumers, the less very open um, communication you need. So you, you probably don't need newspaper advertisements if you can if you can say and if it's true that you can reach all the people that have um, the products directly because you have their email addresses. Sometimes you still need to go by a newspaper, but it's a way to, to avoid a newspaper um, ad, or at least try to avoid it. Yeah, so we have the legal people throughout the whole process. Um, also, if um, not only for the decision finding, but also afterwards when we're speaking about how to carry out the product recall. Another uh, department which is very important is the communications department because they can find a wording which um, which is yeah which speaks the language of the company which is a positive wording which fits with the aims of the company and they need to align with the legal people on a wording that makes this product recall a good thing and the communication people um, well if they have some experience with product recalls, they also um, straight away say, we need Q&As. Do you have any idea what you need Q&As for? For For whom and with what information? You might need Q&A for retailers. Because if you have a consumer product and if you have a mass consumer product such as, as a coffee machine, and you sold it via um, Saturn or Media Market Germany, and I, I don't know the, well, in other countries you probably have other, other shops. <laughs> um, but they are large retailers of consumer electronics. Um, then, first of all, then you, you don't know your customers, your end customers, you no, don't know the consumers. But you know that a lot of them bought probably um, the devices in Media Markt or Saturn or any other shop. So what you could do is you could put a poster or something in these shops because you think when they bought their coffee machine there, when they need a new CD player or a new iPod, whatever, they probably go there as well. And then if we have a sign at the cashier, they might see it and they might bring um, the safety relevant faulty product back. Um, this is the strategy to reach, to reach uh, customers, but then you need to give this information about your safety relevant product fault to the retailer. So you give it to someone who's not directly in your influence anymore. And you need, you need to give them some guidelines what to do with this information. And you also need to give them guidelines what to say when people see the sign at the cashier and then they are, it's their turn for paying another product and they say, how can this be? I bought this very expensive coffee machine and now you're telling me it's burning. How can this be? And then the people, they need to be prepared. 
So you might need Q&A for retailers or for other um, parties and economic operators in the distribution chain to be prepared for questions. You also might need Q&A for your own people. You, you need a call center. Um, according to the European rules, you have to provide a toll-free number in the recall advertisement so c customers and consumers can call um, a call center and you need to prepare the people in this call center. They need to know what to say. And it's not only consumers calling there, but it's also people from media and they might put the more tricky questions than the customers and consumers. So this is something that needs to be prepared and it has to be prepared and people have to know about what to say on the day when the recall is advertised. So within a small framework, a uh, time frame, sorry, within a small time frame, there's a lot of organization to do. It is very important that on the day of the rollout, everybody's prepared, everybody knows what to do um, in order to have a smooth product recall going on. And then there's another aspect, um, which is, again, rather a legal aspect. In Europe, you have to notify the, um, the competent market surveillance authority of the product risk you identified and of the product recall or the other corrective measure, measure you're taking in, in the field. And this is something which has to be organized and um, worded and aligned with the technical people um, in parallel or yeah, in parallel to organizing the recall itself. And this also takes a lot of time because it's sometimes very important how you describe the technical causes, for example, of the safety related effect. You need to describe them in a way that people can understand it and that it's correct and you need to find a wording which does not um, which does not try to, to say as ah, all not that bad, but you also need to find a wording which is not dramatizing things. So this also takes some time. Um, and then there's one example I would like to just tell you for a product recall which was going and crossing the media in the beginning of this year. I don't know how many people of you are um, like cycling and mountain biking. Are there, is there, are there any mountain bikers, cyclers? No, but maybe you, maybe you heard, you still heard of the large um, bicycle recall, which was in spring this year, it took place in spring this year, mainly in the US. Um, and if I recall, yeah, if, um, well, it was also on the internet and um, in the internet, if you Google it, you can also find, um, you always can find a joint press release between the manufacturer recalling, recalling the product and the CPSC, the Market Surveillance Authority. Um, so there was a large bicycle um, product recall, recall of mountain bikes, and it was mountain bikes that had, um, that had a, um, what's the English word? Well, the German word is Schnellspanner, and it means that where you have the wheel in the frame, you don't need a screw like a real screw, but you can have, like, you have a... Quick release. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> quick release. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It's a, with a quick, re quick release. And um, they had seen that the quick release, if not closed properly, can turn more than, or can open more than 180 degree and then come in contact with the, um, with the brakes of, of the bicycle and then it would uh, stop the whole bike and you would fall over the front wheel. There was even few accidents, yeah, with very severe injuries. Um, and why I'm talking um, about this product recall is this part, the quick release, was a part that's also in other bikes probably because and this is something very specific about the production chain. If you have, if you are a manufacturer of a consumer end product, such as a CD player, um, DVD player, whatever electronic product, you buy parts that you build into your product from other manufacturers. And then if you have the obligation under European law, to also monitor what your competitors are doing. And if you see that a competitor is 
having a product recall and you can see that it's due to a part that's also in your products, you also need to investigate in this. And um, I, I don't know because I didn't, I didn't um, follow this any further whether there have been any uh, further product recalls of other bicycles, but my first thought when I read this product recall was that this part probably is also in other bikes because, well, except for they have it very specifically made and designed for them, but um, I cannot really imagine that. <laughs> for, so, yeah. Just, just on that, um, we talked a little bit earlier about the relationship between the reseller and the manufacturer. Now you're talking a bit about the supplier of components to the manufacturer. Is the law in Europe very strong with respect to the obligations or the liabilities, I think, in that way, um, which pass back to the... Um, I know from the reseller point of view, when you have a reseller agreement between manufacturer and the retail outlet or the seller to the customer. Right? As you said, quite often the manufacturer doesn't own the relationship with the end user. It's actually to the department store or the revenue department so, uh, the um, coffee maker is sold from. But I would imagine between the manufacturer and the reseller, it be more and more anyway, some kind of like sales has fairly strong requirements of liability transferring back through the reseller to the actual manufacturer, assuming the reseller is not open to change the packaging or anything like that. I would imagine there's also a similar strong relationship between the supplier of parts to the manufacturer, so that it shows that they're both actually not in the manufacturer, but in the actual component supply. Mm -hmm. so can you talk a little bit about the strength of the law in Europe on that yeah. topic, just on that topic? Yeah. It's becoming stronger in the US because of lots of bad examples. Okay. Very like the state, if you like. But you just know that actually the law has become quite strong in that area. Um, yeah. Um, I can say a few words on that. Um, it's. It's rather the, what, what we spoke about now is rather the um, public law side and this all this European product law is public law and then it's implemented into the member states so it's um, important for, um, for the connection between manufacturer or other economic operator, it might also be an importer or even a dealer that is um, taken responsible by authorities but it's always authority, private economic operator and product liability rather <coughs> means the relationship between two private economic operators such as um, supplies or component supplier and end manufacturer. And um, well according to my experience a lot of the claims and recourse claims um, within this relationship come from the contracts. And it's very important even though we do have a legal framework which I um, will talk about in a minute, we do have a legal framework um, giving also responsibility to a component part manufacturer, but still in order to have quick and as clear as possible recourse claims, it should be as clearly as possible in the contract. And um, most or contracts very often have very detailed annexes saying specifically what characteristics has the component part to fulfill or, which is also thinkable and was part of many examples, um, we do have in German case law, which was um, decided by German courts, that the end manufacturer specifically says, I need, uh, for example, an electronic control board for uh, my dishwasher. I don't know how to build such thing. This is what I wanted to look around the electronic board, build something which would give a lot of responsibility to the component part manufacturer. So there are different possibilities to, um, yeah, to have an impact on later claims by the contract drafting. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, it could be, could be. Um, product or safety relevant product 
um, faults can also cause criminal liability of individuals. We don't have a company criminal law in Germany, so it's only a responsibility of individuals. But the and there have been some cases, but it have been cases where, where uh, for one example from the criminal um, um, law is uh, the the case or it was a case about some spray with which you could um, turn leather shoes and furniture more smooth. So it's the very famous Lederspray decision we have in Germany. And in this, well, very, very roughly spoken, the facts of the case have been the chef um, chemical person in the company said, yeah, we do, have these, um, we do have these complaints from the field that people get headaches and have been to the hospital after using the spray. Um, and we looked into the substance which is in this and um, yeah, somehow it seems to trigger these health costs, but I cannot tell you which substance exactly within the spray is the, is the failure. And um, based on these facts, the board of directors decided, okay, we don't know what substance in the spray is dangerous. There doesn't seem to be a hazardous substance, so we decide not to do anything. And this was one case where we really had some criminal responsibility under German law of these decision-making people. Susan, I have two questions, please. First, maybe you have some information. You're talking about recalls. You have a rating, for example, for the last year. Which are the first five products or kind of the product which in the European Union was recalled? We're talking about the consumer electronics product. Yeah. And the second, question <coughs> compared to uh, performance of the consumer electronics product. You know, we are able to find in the market lot of products which are C market based in low voltage directly which answering to the main essential requirements of the low voltage directly, which are very easy to fulfill from the safety point of view. But we're talking about the performance of a TV set, for example. We're talking now about very high definition until the old TV, which are already in the market, the European Union tried to do some separation of the level of the performance or to refer that the manufacturer when claimed for an intended use really to fulfill this intended use. I don't talk now about the efficiency from the energetic point of view for the green tools or other, other aspects. I'm talking only of the performance. Yeah, so to, to answer your first question first, <laughs> um, there is indeed a list I have in my head um, of like the top 10 products being recalled throughout the European Union, but consumer electronics um, in general are not quite on top of this list. Like the European um, Commission um, publishes every week the so-called RAPEX report and it's a list of um, the dangerous products the European market surveillance authorities found throughout the European Union and about corrective measures such as also product recalls. And if you look at these reports over the last year, it's mainly toys that are recalled or where corrective measures are taken. And toys more and more also are consumer electronics because more and more toys have batteries in them um, and are combined. Uh, I have in mind a very recent example of, um, of a CD player for children, which is round and very colorful and um, has a microphone so the children can play karaoke with it. Um, so these are also toys, but they are also consumer electronics. But toys are the number one, um, according to my impression, recalled products throughout Europe. And then we have 
children's fashion is very high ranked as well because um, there's a specific European harmonized standard saying that um, children's clothes may not have any any uh, any things for binding together in the area of the of the neck of the child um, and somehow many manufacturers don't seem to know this European harmonized standard because Almost every week there are some children's clothing in these reports um, where the products are not in conformity with the European standard. And within the consumer electronics, I must say the, uh, the product I've seen most are electric lamps, like small electric lamps. In German we call them pocket lamps. I don't know whether it's in English the same. Um, this is a product um, named very often in the RAPEX report and um, then from the consumer electronic side we have a lot of components so very often I see only USB cable for example connecting your laptop with any other device um, and other accessories that are very often um, um, subject of corrective measures but I also have seen over the last year TVs and um, hi-fi components, um, yeah, but that would be the, the top under the consumer electronics according to my, to my knowledge and impression. And um, the second question in regard to, to um, the performance of consumer electronics, and I understand that you mean the performance, how many years do they work, right? Was that your not like the energy efficiency and how much how how clear is the picture with how much or with how, how can I save current and how can I save money on the energy aspect but um, how long can I use it or no not only this how long for example myself I use one radio set I don't give the name very well-known company, which is manufactured in 73. It worked very, very well. It was the beginning of the transistors in, in, in the transistor, the integral circuit in the technology of the radio set. And until now, in 2015, it works perfect. When I'm talking about performance, I mean up to the really intended use. I'll give one example. One, Coffee machine, not important the name of the manufacturer, very famous, all around the world, which are included one program to have one minute for a short espresso, two minutes for cappuccino or something like this. After two or three months, the software doesn't work. You can use the machine, but the software not exists. I'm talking about the features which are claimed by the manufacturer and in reality are very short time in mm -hmm. use. It's not producing one validation because the regulatory requirements in the European Union not request this. Yeah, that's true. It's a request to be safe. Yeah. To not electrocutate and to not make fire hazard. Yeah. But if you're talking about the performance, it's silence. Yeah, even though, well, yeah, that's true within this regulatory framework, which is uh, harmonized throughout the European Union, but we still have the contract law and we still have the sales contract, and um, the European Union also intends to harmonize this to a specific extent between the different member states of the European Union and there is a directive on consumer rights within consumer sales contracts and so the main aspects of claims for, um, for non-functioning of features that have been promised in advertisement um, are covered by these rules and so we do have under the sales contract the consumer has a claim for either a new product or repair of the product. Um, 
irrespective whether it's safety, rele uh, safety relevant or not. It's just if it doesn't work the way it should work, so if it's not fit for the purpose um, it was pr promised to be fit for. Um, yeah, so the consumer can, um, can ask for a new product or for repair of the product or under specific circumstances also give the product back, get the money back. And um, the, well, there's a time limit for these claims, which is um, roughly spoken two years from buying it. But within these first years, first two years, we have um, the consumer protection under the contract law in Europe. But the regulatory framework of product compliance and of public law requirements to products are mainly safety related, that's true. They are also environmentally related, so it's not only safety law anymore, it's product compliance by now, because over the last years more and more as aspects which are not relevant for product safety came um, or were included into the system, such as protection of the environment by the energy efficiency directive um, or the WE directive. Um, we do have some um, waste collection schemes for batteries and for electronic devices. So it's not only safety anymore, but it's it's not um, it's not the it's not related to the performance of the products either. No, and in your opinion, like a body which assists the clients in some events of complaint, you consider that towards consumer electronics, the performance can or must be one important parameter, or to maintain the actual situation and to not deal with the performance. From my opinion? Yes. It's just two different things from my opinion. It's the what what the European legislator wants to be monitored by authorities is safety and safety and compliance to other requirements. And the question whether the consumer is happy with the product and whether it it works um, as a, as it should is something which is left for um, the relationship between consumer, manufacturer, consumer, seller. Um, and from the legal, pers or from my legal perspective, this is something which is appropriate because to be happy or not with a product is also a subjective impression. But there is, from the legal perspective, there are some, well, there's even at least a framework in which claims can be made or are uh, time limited. So, yeah. So it's just, it's two different aspects which should have different legal frameworks, yeah. <laughs> Are there any further questions or remarks or? Okay. Yeah. When you go to California these days, um, most of the buildings that are installed are on the front say this building contains materials that are known to be carcinogenic. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But basically, you go in here, you might get cancer. So I was just wondering, are we ever likely to get to the point where we actually see um, a requirement of this sort of notice on our devices? Because if you think about it, our smartphones and other devices are manufactured with loads of fairly dodgy materials and chemicals. This is a very difficult question, and actually I know the sign um, because I've been once to San Jose and the hotel, um, I've been there, uh, had the sign, and I looked up the, because I'm not a US attorney, I'm a German lawyer, but I looked up the provision and I didn't really understand it. I didn't understand why they have the sign on there and what actually can be um, the toxic substances in the building. Um, <laughs> But it really, um, I was very surprised by this. And um, whether we will have such a sign on electronic devices um, is difficult to say. But in the European framework, within the European framework, um, the product compliance law tries to prevent whatever is known as potentially being hazardous is rather forbidden. Um, so, for example, according to the Rose Directive, um, 
um, lead is forbidden in to, to use lead in electronic devices is forbidden and other substances are um, for other substances there are, there are some limits in the whole reach concept I, I don't know whether you've heard of the European reach system it's a very complex system where manufacturers have to register specific chemical substances they want to use in their products and then there again um, the Euro um, a European um, specific commission decides whether substances are taken into the system and with what thresholds for what, what products and then these thresholds are um, well, when you manufacture the specific products you may not um, you may not um, exceed the thresholds given in the REACH regulation. So we have all this regulation to prevent hazardous substances in electronic devices and therefore I hope that we don't have won't have the sign because from my perspective and um, well, I know that there are many people seeing it the same way and it's sometimes even a legal problem giving information to the consumer at one point is too much um, and at one point you give for example if you give a lot of um, safety hints for your product and say don't put on the carpet don't do this don't do this and um, pull the plug after every use and then you have 20 pages of safety hints no one's going to read this and there are even courts and product liability um, litigation in Germany saying um, and well this is something which is discussed in the between legal people and there are different opinions on this but there are some people saying if you have 20 pages of safety hints you cannot expect the consumer to read even one of them because it's too much and so this all these signs and if, if you cannot understand what's written in them and what what do they mean it's it's not consumer protection and not consumer information anymore it's just confusing so I hope we will not have these signs in the future <laughs> yeah States a lot of what's happening there it's uh, trying to limit the liabilities of the, the people that put these signs up or put these rigs in place that's what really drives it so uh, part of that's legal requirements the other thing is that there's there's an awful lot of litigation that goes on in class action suits and various things and so they're they're uh, a lot of the manufacturers will may have these very complicated uh, uh, agreements things of that sort with all kind of caveats and, and various legal terms and stuff. And a lot of it's driven by trying to control their liability. Yeah. But I think it's actually the law in California now that they have anything that might have any kind of toxic emissions they have those things. Yeah, there's a there's a there's a provision for this. Yeah. Can, yeah. I, can I rephrase the question actually yeah. when I'm thinking about it? Yeah. So I suppose I suppose the question could be posed differently. Are we maybe in Europe create trying to regulate too much and we'll eventually get to the point where, you know, devices and, and systems are so complex, we can't actually manage the regulation of them by trying to protect against every eventuality. Yeah, that's rather a technical question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> be, be, because, um, yeah. It's philosophical as well. It's a philosophical question. Yeah. So you don't, you don't actually have to answer it. <laughs> It's just thinking of the difference between the American and the European approach. You know, the yeah, American even says, well, you can use it, but it might kill you. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. yeah you're, taking your risk. you're taking a risk, you know, and in Europe, maybe we try too much sometimes to, to protect against every eventuality. Yeah, that's, in, that's indeed difficult to answer. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a question to think about, and I think, um, well, everybody needs to find his or her own answer working in this field and the answer might be different from the technical perspective and from the legal perspective and also from what you're used to so because well I, I studied German law and then I grew up in this European product law and I think it's a marvelous system <laughs> um, and but but yeah and it's always then when you see something else and another approach it's first difficult to understand the other the different approach and to accept it and and to live in it and that's also a very huge challenge um, while distributing consumer electronics worldwide that you have different regulatory systems and you need to comply with all of them and um, so you might you need people that know the different systems 
Yeah, but from my very personal view is that in Europe we don't have an overregulation, and I hope it's not going to be one. Yeah, that's true. That's, and that should, from my perspective, this should be the main focus of product safety law. It should be to to focus on these, on the severe injuries. Yeah. And but throughout Europe, you can see. Well, I um, well, I have a lot of contact with different European market surveillance authorities because, as we all have the same legal framework, uh, we can from our Munich office also notify product recalls in other European countries um, or deal with them when they have um, complaints about products and um, my impression is they are very open for technical legal argumentation if it's well prepared. So and this might might give or this is also very important for this legal framework. It's not only the rules that we have written down but um, it's also the market surveillance authorities that kind of live and uh, or yeah that have to um, have to implement these rules and the work with them and for them it's also very very um, important I think to concentrate on the big things because they do not have a hundred thousand files um, loading their desk Okay, any further questions, remarks? One more, um, and it's, it's um, a little example that uh, just uh, came through the other day for us in the US. I think it's, uh, it's about electronics and uh, what we put in the bills. And the recall was from Dodge Ram in January, and uh, it was about cyber security, which is the first time I've seen hmm. that come through uh, to actually consume the one about on potential a lot of electronics in, in our um, vehicles to be open to hacking. Yeah. And um, this was the first time I've actually seen a recall come through. Um, they gave me the option of actually, they actually sent a memory stick where you can actually upload new software into the Uconnect um, system in the vehicle, um, which provides emergency Wi-Fi, for instance, or the emergency 911 to call if you have any troubles. And, um, or you can take that and deal and the dealer will upload it for you. Okay. Um, in your your experience so far, have you seen any, um, uh, is there a growing discussion about potential of um, um, the outcome of consumer electronics in some fields of um, the cyber security issue or where that goes? I don't know if you want to take off your comment on that. Yeah. Um it is a huge discussion in this whole smart product atmosphere whether cyber security will one day be part of product security or product safety um, and there's no common sense yet um, according to my impression and it's um, from my opinion it's very difficult to say and we really need to see how the technical development goes further. And in the end, from the legal perspective, it will be the question whether it should be a responsibility of the manufacturer 
or of the um, of the user of the device, or maybe someone in between who is providing some service um, surrounding these smart products over their lifetime. This is something which is not clearly written down in the laws. Um, it's a new legal problem coming with smart products and um, smart manufacturing and smart well um, and autonomous driving is one of the first um, one of the first fields in which the technical development is really um, going quickly. Um, so yeah, this question will will have to be solved, and we will see whether if we have first cases, how it's dealt with by by the courts or whether the legislature will find a specific rule for this, um, but this is completely open. And it will be more complex as we do more Yeah, it will. It will. And I, from my impression and from my very personal impression, there are two, two fields in which um, the, technic, the technical aspects are already very um, developed or um, highly developed. It's um, the autonomous driving and um, yeah, kind of the medical apps, like um, combining um, a blood pressure thing with your mobile phone and sending the data. And this is very personal data, and it's also a field in which cybersecurity will be very important. Um, so yeah, these are the two fields that, according to my impression, are already quite developed and might show which way we go in regard to cybersecurity. So, any other questions, remarks? Okay. Then, thank you very much for being here, for listening to me, for participating, for discussing, even though you expected a completely different subject. For me, it was very interesting um, to also hear your approaches. Um, and, yeah, I hope you enjoyed, and thank you for listening to me. <laughs> thank you very much for Thank you all for being so kind and for your feedback and, and questions. We'll continue in uh, half an hour with the opening ceremony, so we can share a, a chat in the, in the corridor. Thank you very much. Just before we close, I'd, I'd like to say thank you to Susanna Vinde uh, for stepping in and doing this presentation. I know you realize she had nothing prepared. She just did this ad hoc top of her head. <laughs> so it was an excellent job. Thank um, you. We'd like to show you, a, uh, give you a small token of appreciation from our sponsor, Harman. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much.